I like to present or represent uh, some of you, uh, Mathieu Muller from Unity, who is uh, one of uh, regular visitors here in Arl. He, he's been invited a couple of times a year uh, during the photography festival and to the digital festival in October. And with Mathieu, we're always uh, asking him the same question from his point of view as someone who's working with Unity and who's been there for a really long time, who's really a, a, a big player in the terms of a technology universe. He's very uh, technological, he's a bit worried about the future, and from his point of view, what are these metaverse technologies, what are they doing? Where are they now? What pathway have they gone by to get here from their first uh, elements of existence until now? So we asked him to do kind of an exhaustive panorama of the metaverse uh, as it has been imagined and implemented in technology and as it's been projected, as it's the fruit of someone's vision, uh, whether that be from the point of view of a company or uh, a user or an engineer who's building it as a tool. And so our request of him is the same uh, panorama, uh, the metaverse, based on what Unity thinks, and uh, based on everything that happened in 2021 and perhaps a bit of 2022. And, uh, you know, that's something... Yeah, one year ago we were talking about metaverse. It was still uh, kind of indefinite. Uh, now we had Mark Kerberg and Meta who were making big announcements, but we certainly hadn't seen anything yet. And for the last few months, uh, it's been a much bigger, uh, it's taken much more space in the news. And we've had different incarnations of the metaverse, of what people think it is, or was it this, or it's, it always existed, or it doesn't exist yet, or it's virtual reality, or it's Web3, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. So everyone's a bit lost. And there are a lot of questions, needs, that people can understand the different points of views, because it's obviously not been defined yet, and, and no one's going to gain from it being entirely and specifically defined. Um, so during this festival, what we're trying to do is giving you multiple facets, multiple points of view, uh, talking about our different observations, and it's particularly interesting to have uh, 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 the point of view of a large company like Unity, which is collective of artists, and to give voice to, give more definition to, give echo to, give resonance to this definition. So if Matthew is ready, he's almost ready. I saw the title, it's the state of the metaverse in 2022. Hello everyone. So, uh, Fabian has already said everything. It's going to be very f quick, therefore. So yes, I work for Unity. I am in charge of graphics. I was a project manager before I was doing film and animation. And it's something that I've always, it really kind of led me towards 3D. Uh, that those worlds, these com you know, overlapping of worlds. I was very lucky to arrive at a point in my career. Uh, I worked in real, and then I came to Unity, and it was part of some of the technological tools uh, that were overlapping, and I was really lucky to be able to follow them. I was the first employee in France eight years ago. Yeah, first I was the first employee of Unity in, in France, so it's just incredible. So, so last year there were people. Anyone here that was here last year? I've got a okay, two or three people. So last year, what I tried to do was I asked myself the question of why are we talking about the metaverse last year, and not two years before or three years before, or five years or ten years before. And so I had fun kind of laying out, you know, kind of drawing lines between the past and now, and sort of thinking making you know different uh, timelines and and how and and it what interference what are, when are they crossing and in drawing these different lines and these different pathways what i realized 
we were really at a crossroads last year of convergencies, of, of overlapping. We had to look at all these different elements overlapping at one time, from hardware, from creative uh, content technologies, services and business models, and the overlapping of IP, so different contents that really starting to get mixed up that are already mixed up in many over many domains. And my conclusion to that was that in general, all of this is made for us. And I want to continue on that. And as I'm drawing these lines, I thought, what would happen after continuing to look at the trajectory and continue to draw it out? And I had this really strange conclusion that seemed like we went from from personal computers or tablets or, or streaming, and it's going to be potentially uh, in sort of a mixed reality because it could disappear in favor of something else. So we realize that when we create content, it's really evolved with digital twin, machine learning, and all the different experiences we have in 3D film. And we might get to a point where we had a system that's assisted by machine learning and in, in, uh, artificial intelligence, and that would allow us to generate content that uh, would also allow to fill up the metaverse or fill up different metaverses, because we're talking about a scale and a scope that's multiple planets, multiple worlds, and num an infinite number. And the last part, I think, is around the human. The fact that we're, you know, we were started with arcade games. We were working alone or working, playing with two people, multiplayer game at home. And now we're starting to look at this avatar. We're representing a business model. We're representing a responsibility. We are responsible for our own connection. We are an actor in the metaverse. We're a player in the metaverse. And that's how we get those services. And we get those services because we're inside it. And if you go a little bit further down the line, if you imagine at the end of the day that, that these headsets are, you know, are implanted in us, maybe to save energy or to make it more into our reality, and then we find ourselves in a completely digital world. And there's a kind of transhuman evolution. So I was really surprised to actually arrive at this point. And I know I'm probably shocking some people, but I was really surprised. And I thought to myself, so the question coming this year would be, what happened in one year? Did I make such a big mistake in the last year? Or are we still going in that direction? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring back up those lines that I did last year. So this first is about the overlapping of different platforms. So what happened in one year? What happened in one year is that as concerns uh, virtual reality, the uh, market has con of, of glass, the glass market has continued to, uh, to solidify itself. So now we're no longer, uh, they've got inside captors and we have different headsets, all different types of brands. Uh, we're no longer connected to the computer. Uh, we can make a thousand choices when we start playing. And today what you can see in the, the graph uh, to the bottom right with Meta, with Oculus Quest, we've really gotten rid of all the competitors. And it is the main hardware that allows us to navigate in VR. We also see that it's reached its objectives, which were to go over $1 billion in earning. Yeah, $1 billion, I'm not making a mistake. And what's more, it it has m sold more than the Xbox, the latest Xbox. So this is a real platform in and of itself. Um, so now we know that this is solid, and you can see you know, the graph here. We're, we're continuing in that direction. We can also see the increase in revenue. So it's becoming a real market. And we can see that in one year, it's doubled. He wants to adjust its one billion in revenue in terms of software, uh, not in content. And that's a really good comment. Because the question was to say, when we look at the type of content that people are consuming, 
So already the success that it's had, a market is established when we start having players that are generating significant revenue. And also if we look at the previous years, we can see that two years ago, no one was making more than $10 million with VR. And now they're starting to see people do it. And every year, So there's something else that's interesting in that. It's a game market in VR, but it's also sport and music are particularly uh, sought after as well. They are among the contents that are the most successful, not only because the headset, the VR headsets are really, some companies are paying or or they're financing uh, employees to do sports and they're paying for VR headsets. Can we just come back to the economy if we're talking about uh, TripWeb and Edotech? Um, so we, we went really broad into this subject and I, if you don't mind, I want to talk about a few numbers when we talk about what's a AAA, sorry. So that's, that's $30 million in cost of production for a game. And what's interesting about that uh, to the contrary, we, we can see in VR, we have very little, very few applications reach 20 million. And as a matter of fact, for many people, this idea that we would manage to create an economy where one application or one game could generate that much revenue and that we could put in, therefore, 20 or 30 million dollars like a AAA if we could ever have that happen. But that ha and, and it's, it's growing, and it's going in that direction, but it doesn't exist yet. Yeah, I have another graph that explains that, something interesting. What's you could imagine that VR is driven by the same content that's been around for so long. What you see to the right is that every year, so below is the the, the, the material that's come out from the longest amount of time, and then you can see the revenue in the other side. So Bit Saber, Super Hot, uh, they came out first. They were adapted, and they were kind of like the first initial market hits, like Tetris or Mario on Game Boy. But what we also see is that really, despite that, there's a continuity in terms of success, uh, even for those. Um, but even those that are really just have just come out, they, they reach a great success quickly. And what we can see is that globally, and this is where we're talking about the metaverse, the multiplayer games, which you see here, the three first col columns, they are multiplayer games or in co-op, and they are taking up most of the market. Now, this could be biased because multiplayer games are more expensive to develop because there's more investment, they earn more. In general, we can see that multiplayer games are important in VR, and we can see that there's almost no games that aren't multiplayer, so it's not, we still have a lot of work to do in that regard. And that's what, what you were saying, and I love this graph here, which really shows the evolution of video games in the previous years. And that's where we can see where we're at in an industry because everything's relative, right? So we see the little purple one all at the top. And if you if you put the purple one and you put it at the beginning of the industry, it really looks a lot like Game Boy. So that's kind of, it's like the same type of uh, pathway that Game Boy. So we're at the beginning of something. And we can see the overlapping with the handheld uh, games that were clearly um, eaten over um, just completely overrun by mobile games. And we might be able to ask ourselves, the future, as we get bigger and bigger, will mixed reality or VR be eclipse mobile? Is it worldwide now or no? Is it global? It is. Uh, this, this graph represents worldwide numbers. And oftentimes the graph is, and this is a great one, but sometimes we're always missing in information. It's in all these years, Asia has represented zero to the left and then 50% of the market to the right. So at the same time as these platforms and these uh, technological revolutions are taking place, there's 10 and hundreds and millions of new, or hundreds of thousands rather, of new players that are coming into play. And they really do represent a huge 
portion of this. And you kind of do see that in the end. You, you see leaps and bounds. We also see there's not a lot of going back. There's not a lot of backtracking here. Well, something's always scary with VR. It's like, well, is it going to all fall to pieces? And we see that in the end, no. There's only one real gap I, I, pointing at it. At the very beginning of uh, video game playing, where there was one game that was about the content management in GeoPlasma, I believe he said. And the fact that in the future, what's going to happen, PS VR, VR 2 is going to arrive, and there's going to be a real battle in terms of content, and there's Pico 4 that's also up, com up and coming, and he's also got a huge challenge in terms of content. It, we are going to have to have content, and when there's competition, and you could say, you know, Quest took over the market, well, that's good because that consolidates, but it's not good because there's only one major player, even if the content can be, you know, come from all different uh, directions. But tomorrow, there's going to be a lot of competition, so for creators, this is the El Dorado, uh, because they're going to have a lot of, uh, there's more content there is as well, um, more there's quality content, um, more there's competition. And Pico comes from where? From China. And it's important. They're really The Chinese are really big and new player, and they're really well financed. And they're now in competition with Meta, Sony PlayStation. And also what's interesting, whether it be Pico or what you see here, everyone's probably seen this video with Mark Zuckerberg, who's fencing uh, in a mixed reality. It's a video that was really successful because everyone was kind of, the reality mixed, mixed reality is really breaking this idea of pure VR. So it's starting to inspire people, thinking, oh, that would be really nice to do that. I'd really feel like I was with someone else. And all the headsets now are going to propose mixed reality. There's going to be a color screen. The Pico 4 has a color screen. So we can really go outside, so we can really mix our realities. We really can. And, and, and based on where I was last year, we really are heading towards this blue dot I have, which is this mixed reality. Uh, there's a real consolidated market. And what's also interesting, I was looking at if my to see if my, my smoke and mirror theories of transhumanism uh, markets. And, and what I discovered, and I'm always surprised, this is some research that came out in September from Meta, and this is really interesting. I was searching for, I was trying to see if there had been progress in terms of implants that had been made, and or if we've moved forward. And the first uh, thing I found were implants to go into your brain, and it's made by Meta. So it's just quite funny. Uh, what's interesting is it wasn't exactly what I thought was in, in, in my terms of my vision. But it's really impressive what you see here. This is what the person is thinking. They have to think about questions. And the implants, you can't really see it. But so there are electrodes in your brain. And for example, uh, in the left system, there's a machine learning system that's going to allow you to code or recode or, or to decode, sorry, what the person is thinking. Before, we were always looking at some sort of word recognition one by one. And so the results were really difficult to distinguish between words that we recognize. But now machine learning is allowing us to learning a certain number of questions or phrases that will allow from a total of the, the, a global context to come out with full phrases. Now, I really like these things because it's scary on one hand. Like, for augmented reality, if you think that we've got, for example, a headset linked to your phone, you might think it's a little bit annoying that you're going to have to speak to get your thing to be controlled. And you'd be like, hey, can I look at my, when you're, at the, and you're in the subway, you're like, well, I need to check my emails. So, but you'll have to speak more quietly, maybe, or speak differently, so that you can speak into your augmented reality. It's practical, it's scary, and this research is going to help, for example, mute people speak. Today, so it's really 
great to see this research that's kind of scary, but that it can also bring really positive things. I think I can move on to my next part. So I also ask myself a really kind of a weird question, always within my strange theory of putting things inside your body. And that was, what is consumption? So I was asking myself sustainable questions, like, well, all this is cost of energy, it's all processors. And I realized that I have no idea uh, how much a, a, a game, a, a computer consumes. So it's between 300 and megawatt hours, about 300 megawatt hours, versus a headset, a VR, which you can see in yellow, that's only uh, using uh, 11 watts. So that's important when we're developing a new system. For example, in Unity, we've got a hardware uh, motor for mobile that uses less energy. It's conceived especially for that. And then we have another motor for the IM. And that's something we forget when we choose technologies or when we develop systems. If we make a, a computer console game, it's going to consume more. Uh, depending on the motor that's being used or the processor that's being used or the graphics being deployed. And what's really funny about that is I thought, is how much does a body, ha a human body, so if you were to kind of make a generative headset or renewable headset and a body consumes 200 to 1,000 watt hours. So 200 when we're relaxing and 1,000 when we're not. So it's mostly moving our hands that we're consuming or moving our feet that we're using this energy. So it's actually looking at we're <laughs> a body consumes more watts than a gamer PC, a gaming console, uh, where, whereas a headset, a VR headset, is like one-sixth of that. And I also want to, just on a side note, something I wanted to highlight, I did the animation for the film uh, done in real time. And it was one of the aspects, uh, an ecological aspect. I heard not long ago that one of the last Pixar films consumed as much as one year of food in electricity for all of Paris, or one year of uh, electric consumption in Paris, excuse me. And this series, which I presented once before, called Element and Lucy, made with unity, there's no sound on the video, but this series was out on TV5. It's like 52 episodes. It's a pretty basic TV series. So beyond the fact that they were super happy because the director had added all these et details like little butterflies, everybody, because it's all about nature and ecology, they'd, always in rea they'd also in real time, they made a film about ecology to make kids aware of um, when you take a plant from one place, it means that the animal can't live there anymore. And we thought it was kind of weird to do that when using up all this energy. So they did a resume at the end, it was rewritten about how much it cost, you know, it relatively. And so it took a few hours to calculate a 12-minute episo episode, whereas, so it takes a few hours on a machine, whereas in 12 minutes traditionally would have taken 200 years. So we've got servers so that it calculates it more quickly. But you can see the scale of energy savings and what this could represent in terms of for one film like, you know, how the, the entire town of Paris could be, you have electricity. So, you know, that's a little bit outside of the metaverse, but not too far. Um, so we're going to the second line. Yeah, is it interesting? Okay, great. So the second line is content and crea content creation. Where are we at? So this is the most annoying slide in the world. It looks like a motorcycle from uh, Perry to car. <laughs> what you have to retain from this slide, what's rather interesting, is that to build a metaverse, an open metaverse world, 
we, we often mix up tons of things, but often when we're talking about m building an open metaverse world, it doesn't mean it's open for users. Often say, yeah, yeah, it's open, but it just means that we use open technologies. It's important to highlight that because building a metaverse means having lots of standards, lots of formats, lots of uh, interoperability standards so we communicate one with the other. And what's funny is you've got like the Academy Software Foundation you can see here that comes from the world of cinema and that oversees all the standards that are used to making a film and that started to look into the metaverse. In one year, between last year and today, there is the Metaverse Standard Forum that's been developed and that's become a consortium of com companies that we're a part of and our the objective is to define standards specifically to the metaverse for interoperability between systems so the objective is to define so when we make a game it kind of looks a little bit like when you make a standard film but in the metaverse there are specificities so w what is it how are we going to move things from one to the other? And that's not something we do in video game development or in film development. Things and people. So all of this is based on two standards, USD for everything that's content creation, because it's called universal sign description, and that's the base that's the most used in the film industry for using, uh, overseeing massive amounts of data. Um, so everything that's that's everything content creative creation wise in the metaverse or for example if you want to build a city or a bunch of complex things like a forest you're going to have to bring it all together and then you have to one half a person move a tree while another person looks at another issue you've got to resolve all the you know interactive issues and that's being pushed forward and then there's jltf to retain certain assets and that's something we have to use with open standards so you have to know that in one year we were talking about machine learning last year, but it's just insane what's happened uh, in one year. There was a DALI. Neat journey. And we have, we've just, we've nonstop seeing on social networks, tweets just constantly. Uh, people are working on this and it seems like innovation is just every single month some kind of new innovation. Meta making a text, making a video. Uh, NERF is going to allow NVIDIA that really has a construction system that's fantastic. From just a few images, it goes with, it's gonna reconstitute the images with uh, machine learning. So you have to take a whole bunch of photos and it's kind of annoying. There's a lot of things to process, but these machine learning will make these animator photos roughly and it's really fast. So just from just a few photos now, in one or two minutes, they can reconstitute a 3D model just like that. And it's so interesting. It's something they came out in March or April, um, five, six months ago, and immediately, one week ago, based on that technology, we can say, if from just a few photos I'm able to make a 3D model, then if I have text or image from coming in different directions, I would be able to generate 3D models using the first system. So I generate a few uh, images, uh, like on the left, uh, a horse, uh, a horse from above, a horse from, from the side. We send it all into the system, and then we get a 3D horse. And I'm just, I mean, it's crazy. And all these things. We can insert just text and then generate um, a 3D image. And then we can ask it to uh, generate, you know, um, the little horses you can see here. It goes really, really quickly. And it's really important in building these worlds because in the content generation of these worlds, uh, there's going to be a lot of challenges. For what we do, I talk about two things. We purchased another company called Art and Jin who was doing AI for the last 12 years. And we stopped uh, this, uh, the services to put it all onto the cloud. Uh, we were unfortunately not able to transform. Uh, hopefully we will someday. But we did something else that was interesting and I'm gonna show you. 
to show you how AI is really touching into every domain. We uh, won the C. Graffield Timelight that uh, is an award for real-time projects that are the most innovative. And so you can see us on the stage with a bunch of others. And this system with machine learning, in by just moving certain parts of the body, we're able to make the entire body move in a real, in a really realistic way. So it's like we're taking a person to create animation. You know, how do you do that? How do you move your elbow? How do you move this other part? Um, we don't always have the right elbow. So now it's like we really have a person, and we say, you know, stand like this, l lower yourself down, do this. And so in a few seconds, it allows us to make a, a position and animation. Uh, it's a real breakthrough. I'm trying to go fast because I feel like I'm really slow. Uh, we have one or two minutes left. So I have, I still have 200 slides. Um, no, it's going to go rather quickly. So on avatars, that's been a, a, an amazing evolution. I won't be able to show all my videos, unfortunately, but just to quickly say that NVIDIA uh, started a system called Avatar Cloud Engine, and that's just fabulous. It's a kind of tool where we can, um, you know, plug in different AI, and it's going to tell us, it's going to ask, they recognize text on specific items. For example, in one department, or do you want them to ask, answer any question? And then you plug it in and you ask it, would you like us to transform the information that we've received into text? that we use the machine learning for an automatic reply, and then the machine learning, we're going to plug it in, and we're going to have the help us make the face move. And then we're connecting all these things one after the other. And then we kind of build our own avatar that we're going to go integrate into any system. And then it can be plugged into any system of 3D avatars. So it can control a metahuman or characters. So MetaHuman has also evolved. It allows us to create human characters, human 3D characters. There was a, a huge leap forward created this year where we can scan someone's head, and it's going to generate a human with that face. So that will avoid us having trying to imitate someone. And on our uh, side, We've also made a lot of progress. We purchased uh, a company this year called Ziva Dynamics. And that it, it Unity, you can see in real time, what's really interesting is that once again, to animate a face, this is really unique technology. If to animate a face, it has to be realistic. And you have to have all the deformations and the changes of the skin. That's something, uh, for example, we have uh, we do in cinema. So they did a, a, a system with machine learning, and that's going to allow us, it, it, it kind of trained itself on all the different movements of a person of reference. And then we're going to put that person's scan of their face on it, it's like a metahuman, and the machine learning is going to teach that face to move all its muscles and its skin, and it takes 30 mega, but it's going to allow us to regenerate the entire way that the tissues move on the face. So we're simulating the human movements in a very light and soft way, and then we're doing it in real time. So for example, now I've talked uh, for two minutes, and talking in two minutes in a film could cost hundreds of millions of dollars. Well, we did that in one month. And we integrated their entire facial movement system. I'm not, uh, I can't say any more, I can't show, I don't have a little, maybe I have a little bit of time to show the demo of the face. This is a demo that we came out with a few months ago. One of the biggest issues that digital humans have are hair. It's kind of, it's really annoying. There's a lot of them. Um, what's more, there are different lighting effects, light that goes through it, the shadow, so it's really complex. And it's something that we wanted to do in this film. So this is um, done on PS5, and you really can't see much here. But all the games are simulated in real time. So you see that the hair will come down. We'll we, we change the gravity, and so the hair start starts popping up. So 
once again, we can see the hair going up and that, that's something we can edit and see today on PS5. So there's been an incredible leap forward in terms of uh, fabricating digital humans and in the rendering techniques. And that's it. We also did a demo with the lion. Uh, I can show you after if we have time. We thought, well, if we could do all this hair, we could do a bunch of uh, like, like hairy animals. Um, quite, I quite like that. And so we simulated all the hairs of the lions in real time. Again, a, a demo that you can have on PS5. But I'll, I'll really let you see it in real time uh, during the questions, for example. And then we're going to end up with uh, two small things. One, one of the main challenges is to scale infrastructures. Multiplayer games, uh, I've never played with as many players, so it's a real scale issue. But 5G, we're going to have to use techniques like 5G that we see as being more and more deployed to do local computing to oversee the number of players that are playing at the same time. And, and we see that there's a lot of investment being done, and we are investing there too, so that's a big trend. And the last thing I want to say is the economic model, which also has a lot, we have a lot of uh, changes this year. On one hand, we see that personal data is more and more secure, so Apple has secured, so we have no more uh, advertising, or it's more, it's more and more difficult, rather, for advertising in the virtual world. So the question of the metaverse is going to be to say, is advertising allowed? Do we have to reinvent the advertising with new rules? For NFTs, there were two things. Before the, the status quo for video games was that Steam banned NFTs and banned uh, that Microsoft uh, form inside Minecraft. But those who didn't ban it are saying that we're researching it before making that decision. So what's interesting with that, there was a status quo that said we're not going, but there's also a common theory that we are interested in doing it, but we're just not moving forward quite yet. And the very last part is about subscription. This is a business model that today you can see in a lot of different areas in video game, which is really like the last chain, the last link on the subscription chain. Um, we've got the music, we've got the film, and now we've got the subscription, and it's really had phenomenal progress. So all that to say, for myself, when I look at all this, I feel like we're on the right path, but one thing is missing. This thing that's really centered around human. So there's a lot about platforms, there's a lot about contents, but we haven't resolved the fundamental issue of the rights and the and the, the laws and the things that y humans must respect and who's going to oversee those rules in the virtual world. And I think when we really define that, then we'll have actually entered into the metaverse. I had too many slides, sorry.